Hello psychology students. In a recent uh, lesson we've talked about the definition of forgetting and uh, we've been learning about memory obviously and in this lesson I want to talk about a couple of important factors that influence our ability to remember and our chances of forgetting. So let's start by having a look at this definition of forgetting. So you need to remember that forgetting is our inability to retrieve information that was previously stored in memory. So there's two parts there that I've highlighted. Uh, it's that obviously the information needs to be stored and stored effectively in memory in order for us to retrieve it, to get it out again. So the two factors that I'm going to talk about today relate to those two things, retrieval and storage. Uh, the first uh, factor that I want to talk about is a thing called retrieval cues. So let's check my spelling here. Retrieval, I before E. Cues. Oops. Retrieval cues refer to um, a cue is like a stimulus, so they're different stimuli that help us to retrieve or locate information in memory. So if you imagine your brain a bit like a map, and let's say you've got a memory located right here. I'm obviously oversimplifying, but this is an illustration to try and explain what I'm talking about. So you've got a memory stored in your cerebral cortex right there. And let's say you've just heard something. So that information that you've just heard is in your auditory, uh, primary auditory cortex. Again, just an illustration. This isn't exactly how it works. You need to be able to get from this site where you uh, heard the information and try and link it to something you've remembered. You need to find your way across to that memory. So that ability to uh, navigate your, your neural circuits um, in order to locate and then retrieve the information is what we're talking about. And so sometimes you won't be able to remember something because you don't go on the right path. You meander off this way and get lost and never reach the destination that you needed. What a retrieval cue does is it's like a map. It's something that helps you to go, uh, this is the direction I need to be looking in. It's something to help you get where you need to go. So let me, that's an illustration. Let me actually go through and give some real examples. So there's two types of retrieval cues. They can be context dependent cues. Or they can be state dependent cues. Your context is your the environment around you, right? When I talk about your context, I'm talking about where are you, what's going on outside of yourself. So context-dependent cues are external cues, whereas state, your, your state refers to your internal being, what's going on inside you. And so these are all internal. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, have you ever done that thing where you Say you're sitting in your lounge room and you think to yourself, oh, I need to grab that book from my bedroom. And you head into your bedroom. And when you get there, you're like, why am I here? What did I need? Oh, I can't remember. And so you go back to your lounge room. And as soon as you get back to the lounge room, you're like, oh, I needed that book. That's occurring because of context dependent cues. When you're in your lounge room, that's the context in which you thought I need that book. When you change context, go to your bedroom, you no longer have the lounge room as a cue, and so you've forgotten temporarily. You're unable to retrieve the information about why you're there. When you get back to lounge room, it's a cue again, and you suddenly recall, oh, that's right, I needed a book. Um, so that's how, uh, that's how the external context works to, um, to influence your, um, your ability to remember. So it can be things like the location. It can be what you see can be what you hear, can be what you smell, all these things that are outside of your body, outside of yourself, um, but can trigger the memory. Interestingly, uh, the police will sometimes take the witness of a crime back to the scene of the crime because being in that location, you know, they saw a mugging, so you take them back to the dark alley where it happened, the flickering light, the sound of the traffic, the smell of the dumpster, all of these are context-dependent cues that will help trigger the memory and possibly enhance recall and so the witness might remember something that they didn't recall previously. So that's context dependent cues. State dependent cues work in the same way, they're, they're sort of clues or stimuli that will help us um, get back that memory. Uh, 
but this time they are internal. So it's things inside our own body. So it could be our emotional state. It could be uh, our level of tiredness or wakefulness. It could be if we're influenced by some kind of substance like caffeine. <laughs> I'll just write coffee uh, or, you know, alcohol or something else uh, that anything that has influenced your internal state, your mood, your level of alertness, all those sorts of things uh, are going on inside you and will change your ability or enhance your ability to recall if they match. So let's apply all this and think about exams. You're going to be studying for exams in the coming months. And so one thing you could do to help yourself do better on the, your exam is to try to match the context and state dependent cues that you'll have in the exam room with when you're studying. So try and get the same conditions, same context and state dependent things uh, matching when you're studying and when you're in the actual exam room. So let's think about a few context uh, elements of context in the exam room. So for one thing, you'll be in um, You'll be in a quiet room. You'll be sitting at a desk. You'll be handwriting. Uh, you'll have sort of related to that. You'll have paper in front of you. Um, you could also think about the time of day. Uh, I think the psychology exam usually is at 9 a.m. OK, so you could try to match all of those context dependent things. Um, with when you're studying. It's even, uh, it's not just any quiet room, you know that it's the study room. So you could make sure um, that you do a lot of your exam revision in the study room because you'll be in the exact same physical space with the same sights and smells and sounds um, then when you're studying and when you're in the actual exam. And so that could enhance your retrieval in the real exam. Uh, on the other hand, we've got state dependent cues. So think about um, things like I mentioned tiredness, so think about your sleep habits. Could you always um, make sure you get a good night's sleep? Generally, good practice. Make sure you get a good night's sleep before the exam and study at that same 9 a.m. period of time when presumably you'll have the same sort of level of alertness. Um, if you're generally a coffee drinker, then, you know, if you're drinking before, um, drinking coffee before you study, drink coffee before the exam. So if you like, coffee, if that's something in your habit, you know, in your usual routine, then keep it, but keep it consistent. If you don't drink coffee, well, don't drink coffee the day of the exam. You might think, oh, I need a little boost. Well, no, because you want to be in the same sort of level of alertness and same headspace as you are usually. Um, so as much as possible, try to get these things matching between your study times and your actual exam times. Okay. That's context and state dependent cues. That's retrieval cues. Um, so retrieval cues obviously aid our ability to retrieve information that has been previously stored. The second example we're going to look at now uh, does relate to retrieval as well, but it also considers this idea of that we need to actually store the memories and store them well in order to make it easier to retrieve them. So the second uh, factor that I want to talk about is called um, it's called rehearsal. I nearly blanked for a minute. That's interesting. I didn't have the right retrieval cues. And there's two types of rehearsal as well. There's maintenance rehearsal and elaborative rehearsal. But before I get back to that, you've heard the term rehearsal because you've heard of school plays and things. To rehearse is to go over something, right? You rehearse until you know your lines and you know your movements for a play. In the same way, we can memorize information, any information, by rehearsing it. So we could do that through a system called maintenance rehearsal. To maintain something means to keep it up, right? If I maintain my home, I'm not changing my home. I'm not adding to my home. I'm just looking after my home so it doesn't fall down. And that's the idea of maintenance rehearsal. Maintenance rehearsal will keep information into short term memory. It helps sort of loop it around and keep it stored beyond the 30 seconds that um, short-term memory usually has as its maximum duration and it involves maintenance rehearsal generally involves just repeating something over and over so if someone tells me their phone number and i need to remember it until i get to my phone you know it's in the other room i might say the number over and over and over and over 
um, so that it will last 60 seconds while I go into the other room, find my phone, and then can type it in. So repeating over and over helps to just keep it looping around in short-term memory. Now that might then get encoded into long-term memory, but it's not going to be very well encoded into long-term memory because I haven't um, I haven't rehearsed it very effectively. I haven't encoded it or um, stored it very effectively by just repeating it over and over. So while it might be in long-term memory, it's not going to be stored very well there, and so it will be harder to retrieve later. But if I use elaborative rehearsal, then it will be encoded better, and that will provide more points of access, more retrieval, um, more ability, a better connected bit of information that I can retrieve from long-term memory. So elaborative rehearsal, the word elaborate um, helps you to understand what that term means. So to elaborate on something means to add more information. The idea of elaborative rehearsal is that you draw connections between the new information and information you've already got stored in long-term memory. You're drawing connections. Um, so if uh, you're trying to remember something like let's say you're trying to remember the term uh, rehearsal, okay? Um, so when I talked about rehearsal, I didn't just say rehearsal, I connected it, so we've got the original thing, rehearsal, and then I connected it to, to plays, and then I talked about, well, what does it mean to rehearse? So I talked about the definition, um, I talked about, uh, when I talked about plays, I talked about lines and I talked about uh, movements, right? And so I'm trying to create this sort of concept map of information that will all lead you back to this um, to this new term of rehearsal so that you've got it tightly integrated with other memories. And what that means is you might start by thinking, oh, what's that term again? Oh, it had something to do with plays, like memorizing your lines, because when you rehearse, ah, that's it, rehearsal. And so what I'm doing is I'm creating all these links um, between that term and other information so that that can serve as a, like I said before, like a map that will help you to guide and find your way to be able to retrieve the information. So there you have it, a whole bunch of information, that, um, a couple of factors that can influence memory. Knowing about these and being able to apply them well will actually help you as you study. So I really encourage you to learn these terms to a use elaborative rehearsal to store them well in your memory and to continue to use these techniques as you study and prepare for your psychology exam and other things, anything else where you need to remember important information long-term, use these techniques. Thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing the fruits as you apply these techniques in future assessment tasks and exams.